Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out for our lecture tonight. Before we get started, let me mention a couple of the upcoming lectures that we have. On Thursday, August the 20th, Dr. Michael Woods from Marshall University will be discussing emancipation and statehood in West Virginia. On Thursday, August 27th, Richard H. Payne will present African American Life, a Personal Perspective as the second of the 2015 Block Speakers series. And on Tuesday, September the 1st, Clarence Prego will be discussing flintlock rifles of West Virginia. But tonight, we're going to talk about the New River Gorge Bridge. And our speaker tonight, Aaron Reeby, grew up in Northeast Ohio and received a Certificate in Historic Preservation and a Master's in American History from Youngstown State University. After graduate school, she worked as a consultant on projects such as the Nebraska Historic Highway Survey and the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site in South Dakota before coming to the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office in 2003. In 2006, she became the National Register of Historic Places and Architectural Survey Coordinator for the State Office. So with that, we'll turn it over to Erin Reeby. I wasn't expecting such a nice crowd tonight, so thank you all for coming out to hear me. Uh, the, the quilt behind me was uh, made by uh, Gertrude Bloom in 1976 as part of the United States Bicentennial Celebration, and it was one of six quilts that were on um, display at the time. So in 2003, our, um, or 2013, our agency in the state was celebrating our uh, sesquicentennial, and I was asked how our office could potentially um, contribute to that celebration. I was very excited to offer to prepare a National Register of Historic Places nomination for the New River Gorge Bridge, although it was only 36 years old at the time. In general, properties uh, have to be at least 50 years old to be listed in the National Register, unless they are of exceptional importance. Um, superlatives, unfortunately, such as being the longest or the highest, the tallest, littlest, um, generally don't cut it for National Register listing. So I had to go and do uh, major research to determine um, to make this an exceptional significance uh, case for National Register listing. Um, and what I found was the bridge itself is a fairly conventional uh, design. Simply put, it's a continuous span, open spandrel arch truss bridge. Uh, however, I found that it is of exceptional significance for its ex existence represents a number of construction achievements, not only related to the massive size of the bridge, but also to the challenges of the site, including the rugged terrain, the deep gorge, and the then remoteness. Further, it is of exceptional significance for the impact it had on quarter L communities at the time. So this, repre uh, this presentation represents some of the findings that, um, from the research I conducted as part of that National Register nomination. And the bridge was eventually listed in the National Register on August 14, 2013 at that young age of 36. So I hope today um, I'm able to give you a different um, uh, part of the history of the bridge than you're used to hearing about. So the need for adequate uh, transportation route in the New River Gorge area was long recognized by residents. In September of 1956, the headline article in Oak Hill's Fayette Tribune urged construction of a bridge to span the New River Gorge. Such a structure, the article argued, would greatly increase present prosperity and act as a guarantee of good times for the future. It would attract industry and therefore help develop the Fayetteville Oak Hill area, as well as, and I'm quoting, the immense undeveloped coal area on the opposite side of the river. The exact location and design of such a bridge, however, would not be initiated for more than a decade after this article and would not reach fruition until 1977, more than 20 years later. From that time, many obstacles were overcome to create the megastructure. While well, nothing developed immediately, in 1963, President Kennedy asked the President's Appalachian Regional Commission to prepare a comprehensive plan for the economic development of the Appalachian region. A year later, in 1964, the Commission report, reported that Appalachia would not see economic growth unless the construction of a modern highway system throughout the region became top priority. 
So the result was the Appalachian Development Act signed by President Johnson on March 9, 1965. And it formally established the Appalachian Regional Commission and authorized the Appalachian Development Highway System. The new highway system was not only to provide economic development in rural areas of West, West Virginia and throughout Appalachia, but also to supplement the growing interstate system of that time and provide access to areas within the region. One documentary described the system in West Virginia as a combination of enterprise, ingenuity, courage, and technology that began forging the key links to a highway system that would last open up America's most beautiful states to all of its citizens. In its early years, the development of these highways, including six total in West Virginia, was ARC's most notable, noticeable achievement. One of those highways, known as Corridor L, was to be a 70-mile link between I-79 near Sutton and I-77 near Beckley. Once constructed, Corridor L would save travelers nearly 45 miles and an extra hour of travel. One obstacle to this route, as you know, however, was the deep gorge of the new river in Fayette County. So the first discussions on how to span the gorge included the construction of a four-way highway descending one side of the gorge and ascending the other side of the gorge, but that concept was quickly eliminated as too expensive at a potential cost of $65 million. Thus, the State Road Commission decided a mammoth bridge was the only option. By the spring of 1967, the West Virginia State Road Commission engaged Michael Baker, Jr. Incorporated to proceed with designing the 11-mile section of Corridor L, which included a bridge to span the gorge. Within a quarter about only a mile wide, Baker established nine different possible routes, including two bridge locations, possible locations and presented them at a public hearing in the spring of 1970. The final route and the bridge location were selected based on economic considerations, design characteristics, and the social and environmental effects on the area. Pictured here, Clarence Knudsen, Chief Engineer and Director of Structural Service for Bridge Designers at Michael Baker, described how they determined that a steel arch was the best solution. He explained, a suspension bridge would be economically feasible, but was ruled out because the towers would ride up, rise up over 350 feet above the mountains, posing a hazard for aircraft. An eight-span truss was also technically feasible, but it was ruled out because, in his opinion, it wouldn't look good in this setting, and because it would require extremely high piers, which would have been very expensive to construct. Lastly, the width of the gorge was much too wide to even consider using concrete arch, and thus the design of the steel arch bridge began. It's estimated that man hours used in the design of the bridge by Baker were equivalent to one individual working full-time for 15 years. Once designed, the contract to construct the bridge was finally awarded on June 21, 1973 to United States Steel Corporation's American Bridge Division which beat out three other bids with a proposal just under $34 million, though the final cost reached nearly $37 million. American Bridge Division's bid was actually nearly $7 million less than their closest competitor and 26% under estimates. Even so, at the time, the project was the West Virginia Department of Highway's largest undertaking in its history, not only due uh, to the uh, extraordinarily high cost, but also because the federal government shared in 70% of the cost rather than the normal 50%. Governor Archmore described the forthcoming undertaking as follows. From an engineering and construction viewpoint, this bridge will truly be a most significant undertaking. But even more importantly, the construction and completion of this project will contribute greatly to the economy of the state in general and the Fayetteville area in particular. So the contract's ink was barely dry before construction got underway. By the summer of 1973, American Bridge Division began constructing access rows and proposed approachways. To keep on schedule, they planned various tasks to take place simultaneously. While hillsides were cleared, as shown here, concrete <coughs> forms were taking shape as they were being filled with concrete by the Foster <coughs> Creighton Company. The construction also had to come, uh, overcome the massive deep ground voids left behind by prior coal mining. These voids were actually discovered under critical places, including intended locations of two of the piers. So they were sealed through six inch holes with special concrete and sand grouting mix that formed a series of conical supports providing the footing. The process was monitored by below ground cameras. 
all the yellow highlighting on these slides are mine, so I hope you could see here. And so in February uh, 1974, the workers began construction on the concrete supports for the bridge's vertical columns on each side of the gorge. The abutments and column supports included 17,300 cubic yards of concrete and 618 tons of reinforcing bars. Each concrete foundation included sturdy steel grillage and embedded high-strength bolts that would eventually line up with steel box sections of the columns. After tension was applied to the anchor bolts, their pipe sleeves were fitted with non-shrink grout. Meanwhile, fabricating plants in Ambridge, Pennsylvania and Gary, Indiana were busy converting mathematics to reality by preparing steel members, assembling them to confirm accuracy, and disassembling them for transport. Cords were milled to a tolerance of one one-hundredth of an inch, cutting the bolt requirement for major cords by 50% and reducing costs considerably. Such precision was established through the use of then-modern, numerically controlled drill drilling equipment, such as that pictured here. The steel product used in construction of the bridge was U.S. Steel Corporation's own Core 10B steel. During a presentation to the local Chamber of Commerce, J.J. Long, president of the American Bridge Division in 1975, described Core 10 steel with regard to the bridge, stating, the special steel oxidizes for a period of time and weathers to form its own protective coating, blending with the rugged terrain and mountainous region. The deep russet colored steel will combine the qualities of high strength, aesthetic beauty, and low maintenance. Since the use of Core 10 steel negated the need to paint the bridge, the DOH at the time estimated they would save $1 million per needed paint job. So the wide and deep gorge also required the construction of a bridge that would build a bridge, a cableway that trolleyed steel out into the gorge and lowered it into place. While this method was used before uh, con construction of the New River Gorge Bridge, it was never done on this scale. Measuring 3,500 feet, the, like the bridge, the cableway itself set a record as well. Four towers, two on each side of the gorge, each 350 feet high, were constructed. Each side had a boom-type hoist to be used in hoisting cables into position. On Tuesday, February 12, 1974, construction of the bridge entered into the aerial phase. Though an early morning snowstorm threatened operations that day, U.S. Steel's American Bridge Division was able to use a helicopter to string four 5,000-foot, half-inch wire cables from the towers constructed on each side of the gorge. Additional cables were attached, making each of the four increasingly larger until they were three inches in diameter. Each cable included 294 individual steel wires and weighed 30 tons. In all, 22 miles of cable were used. Once complete, trolleys were mounted on wheels and operated on the cables. Powered by diesel engines, these could travel 195 feet per minute. Each trolley had a 50-ton capacity and transported steel beams for the construction of the bridge as well as skip boxes that carried the iron workers out over the gorge and into position. Used in tandem, the cable way could transport up to 100 tons. Due to this capacity, many sections were actually assembled on the ground, saving time and money and cutting down work hazards. The heaviest steel section to be trolleyed out was estimated to be 92 tons. The steep terrain and the width of the gorge did not pro pose the only problem. The then remote location of the site also presented a unique issue. Massive steel members and heavy equipment had to traverse tre treacherous and winding roads to get to the site location. With no rail line in close proximity, American Bridge Division actually established their own small line as close as they could 19 miles away in Nolan, West Virginia. From there, the steel was moved from the train's freight cars to truck trailers. Some especially long members were given their own wheels, such as this one, and transferred to storage and assembly on the Air gorge's north side where it was then organized. However, some steel members were still too heavy and too big to ride the roads. They would be uh, transported via rail actually at the bottom of the gorge and hoisted up by the cable system. On June 14th, 1974, American Bridge Division erected the first structural steel of the bridge when iron workers used the cable system to place a 30-foot box on the concrete foundation on the north side of the bridge. 
pre-drilled holes in the base of the box were lined up with high strength bolts embedded in the already constructed concrete foundation of the tower. This piece was later topped with two additional boxes forming the first support column 98 feet high. Nine towers were then built on the concrete foundations to carry the north and south approaches out from the gorge size to a point where the arch would begin. Each tower, also called a bent, included two columns and cross support members as shown in this drawing. Construction of these steel support columns coincided with construction of the floor truss spans on the approach ways. In total, 23 truss spans between 126 and 143 feet formed the base for the roadway. Each span was assembled at the construction site and then placed using the cable system. Once steel was lowered into position, it was temporarily held together by drift pins and bolts. It was then positioned and permanently connected by high strength bolts. By mid-July, the northern approach extended 325 feet. Due to the magnitude of the project, the New River Gorge became a major attraction. Even the construction of it drew tourists from all over the countries. So two temporary overlooks with parking areas were constructed to help corral the tourists who came to see the massive structure reach from one side of the gorge to the other. And this photo was taken by a neighbor of mine from one of those uh, overlooks. Construction continued year round except when conditions were too wet, cold, or windy for workers to do their job safely. So I'm told. Other safety me measures were taken as well. Temporary handrails and ladders were installed and some iron workers wore safety belts attached to the steel members. Nylon safety nets and chain link fences were installed to provide additional protection. Sometimes called flying carpets, they measured 95 by 135 feet and were attached to the bottom of the cord or the deck truss or arch truss. Iron workers also constructed many sections of the bridge on the ground, which also helped with safety rather than the air. But even with these safety measures in place, the construction of the bridge resulted in the death of one crew member, Dan Snodgrass of Malden, in May 1974, when a temporary platform shifted and several crew members fell, killing him and injuring several others. A second accident occurred on March 25, 1975, when two of the cable towers collapsed due to a malfunction in the luffing hoist brake system. Construction was halted for three months while the towers were rebuilt and resumed in June. On July 28, 1975, American Bridge Division began construction of the actual arch by placing its first cord 60 feet long into place. Now, under typical arch bridge construction circumstances, temporary false work is actually constructed under the bridge to provide support as the arches reach further and further out. However, the New River Gorge Bridge, 876 feet deep, provided a challenge. Rather than false work, engineers used a massive tieback system of steel pipe casing that resembled uh, fishing rods and reels. While the tiebacks were not new in bridge construction, as, temp as technology has changed, so have the details. The tiebacks were secured to huge anchors embedded in reinforce reinforced concrete foundation called dead men. Each dead man was located approximately 200 feet behind the bridge abutment and was nearly seven feet thick. The project used nearly 10 miles of cable for the tieback system. This photo was taken from the arch looking back towards the approach on the south side of the gorge. Another feature of the New River Gorge Bridge was the way the weight is distributed. Like the Arizona Bridge shown in this picture, most arch bridges are fixed, meaning both the top and the bottom cord of the arch are anchored. In this setup, only the bottom cords carry the major portion of the compressive stress. However, this was not an option for the New River Gorge Bridge. So Baker engineers ran numerous computer models to determine the each member size as well as estimated dead load, which is the weight of the structure itself. Due to the exceptionally long span, individual members were too large to be supported by only the bottom cords, as seen here. Rather, both the top and bottom cords in this supporting uh, the stress through a pin at the anchor that was located halfway between the top and bottom cords. To gain a better understanding of the effect of live loads, which, such as wind and traffic, a computer program known as STRESS was used. The program was repeated on each bent to determine the final results for the uniform and concentrated live loads. 
For example, K braces were used between the two arches to provide resistance to wind forces and based on computer models. In 1977 issue of Civil Engineering Mag Magazine, Chief Engineer Knudsen discussed the use of modern computers and the advantage in the design and construction of the New River Gorge Bridge. In it, he stated, today's engineers make use of powerful computers to analyze the stresses in the bridge's members. The computer allows stress on the arch to be calculated much more accurately. The best shape of the arch and the most economical member size can be determined more accurately. The result is much less time needed to do calculations and a considerable savings in steel since materials are being used more efficiently. The use of modern computers also played into the closing of the arch as well. Without the extensive use of computers, engineers for previously constructed major arch bridges were required to measure loads and adjust the length of the closing member in the field, often proving to be very unre unreliable method. Using modern computers, accurately fabricated bid bridge members were produced for the New River Gorge Bridge at the fabrication plant, and the final members were simply lowered into place by the cableway and trolley system, and the two arms of the arch were lowered into place. The New River Gorge Bridge was the first major bridge constructed using this method. Doing so indicated that the designers depended on the accuracy of the fabrication. When the final piece of steel was positioned in May 1976, as shown in this picture, both arms of the arch were lowered into place using the tieback system and the 1,200-ton capacity of hydraulic jacks. No longer required, the arch tieback system was then dismantled and removed. Once the arch was complete, 12 towers and a centered A-frame had to be constructed on the arch. To maintain weight distribution, cross beams were placed symmetrically from the center line outward. In June, iron workers began work on the last major construction of the bridge. Placement of the remaining 14 trusses that would carry corridor L and link the largely inaccessible part of West Virginia to the rest of the country. After a study of other similar deck trusses, it was determined that it should present the smallest possible area to win. Therefore, the trusses were designed in construction with open webs rather than solid web plate girders. On November 1, 1976, the final deck truss, weighing six tons, was lowered into place. It was decorated with the U.S. bicentennial flag as well as an evergreen tree, as seen in the left picture. This topping out tradition was common amongst ironworkers at the time worldwide to indicate that a project or a phase of a project has reached its maximum height. Potentially having Scandinavian roots, the tradition was believed to drive out any evil spirits that moved in during construction. Others believed the tradition that the tree on the structure's highest point gave thanks to the forest god for his wood and his blessing. If you want to click on, we have a short video. Anywhere. Yeah, that should do it. And then we have to make it bigger. <coughs> There we go. 
We're good. Yep. As the deck work was completed, the towers and cable system were dismantled. All that remained was the construction of the remaining roadway. The, the original design called for a width of 64 feet. It was increased to over 73 after a wind analysis determined that a wider deck would decrease wind stress and the lateral deflections of the arch. The bridge also included a thick slab of pavement and reinforcing steel over eight feet thick. The weight of the roadway was needed to top to, at the top as counterweight to absorb and op offset the heavy loads from traffic and the high winds of the gorge. Lastly, the bridge was finished with a strong concrete parapet and rails along each side. Preparations soon got underway for the dedication and opening of the bridge, scheduled to take place on October 22, 1977. Excitement was brewing. The Charleston Daily Mail sponsored a contest to be the first to drive across the bridge with Governor J. Rockefeller. Conce contestants had to enter by submitting an essay answering why I'd like to be with Jay as the first West Virginians to cross the New River Gorge Bridge. And like the quilt behind me, there were other things as well that were created. One bridge observer, L. Brenneman, created a latch hook rug depicting the bridge, while Connor Rule, the local retiree pictured here, built this one out of toothpicks. Architect and drafting students at Stonewall Jackson High School in Charleston built a scale model out of plastic and balsa wood under the instructor of teacher, instruction of teacher Charles Claypool. It's currently on display here at Camp Washington Carver in Fayette County. Various companies began producing and selling merchandise depicting the bridge as well. E.M. Payne Company offered special edition red, white, and blue neckties with monogram insignia of the bridge, declaring West Virginia home of the New River Gorge Bridge. Watkins Gifts offered oil paintings and pewter plates depicting the bridge. The Maxwell Hill Furniture Company offered for sale a limited edition picture of the New River Gorge Bridge in a solid red oak frame. And if they weren't selling bridge merchandise, many companies still used it, the bridge opening in their advertising. Beckley's, Beckley's Hall Furniture Company advertisement read, from across the bridge, hello, welcome. Trident Specialties welcome neighbors on the other side of the bridge. Mountaineer Tour and Travel advertised by inviting readers to cross over to the bridge to your dream vacation. Crawford Chevrolet's ad reminded potential patrons of the opening, the official opening, and it urged the bridge goers to stop by. And apparently, for the first time ever, J.C. Penney's offered their entire stock of pantyhose at 20% off <laughs> to welcome their new neighbors who <laughs> apparently didn't have pantyhose before this. Beckley National Bank purchased an ad space that read, The Bridge to Tomorrow Today and went on to state that the bridge will open new avenues of commercial development by making our area more accessible to interstate travel. And Crab Orchard Planning Mills had simply congratu congratulated Southern West Virginia on the opening, including included a drawing of the bridge. Anticipation of large crowds on dedication day, American Bridge Division cleared and leveled a field to be used for parking cars, and arrangements were made to transport people by bus to the bridge. On dedication day, the Radio Emergency Associated Citizens Team, known as REACT, helped with crowd control and provided other general assistance to motorists using their CB radios. Along also on hand were the Sheriff's Office and several employees of Wacken Hut Security Company. It is estimated that approximately 30,000 spectators arrived on October 22, 1977 to walk the bridge and enjoy the dedication. Other than West Virginia, one onlooker reported seeing license plates from all over the country, including from states as far as Florida and Minnesota. Though some of the spectators camped out the night before and others arrived as early as 5 a.m., the bridge was not open to pedestrians until 7.30. When it was, staff from the Charleston Gazette was waiting in the middle of the bridge to pass out 10,500 scroll certificates. Later advertising in the newspaper, if you were one of the other 20 or so thousand who didn't get one, to let us know. By running, high school student Randy Hicks was the first to arrive and receive the first scroll to commemorate the event. He's holding it here.
During the hours leading up to the official ceremony, bridgegoers enjoy the performances of five different Fayette County High School bands. The affiliated League of Emergency Radio teams provided free coffee. West Virginia State Amateur Radio Council set up three ham radios where people sent out messages to friends and relatives from the bridge for free. Further, a mobile post office was set up to provide bridgegoers with the opportunity to obtain a souvenir. Postcards and letters were postmarked at the New River Gorge Bridge and more than 10,000 special issue stamps were sold. Following the helicopter arrival of U.S. Senator Jennings Randolph's and Representative Harley Staggers, the official dedication ceremony began at noon. It opened with a rendition of the national anthem played by, on a harmonica by Country uh, Music Hall of Fame member Charlie McCoy. Dignitaries, including J Governor Rockefeller, Senator Randolph, and the Master of Ceremonies, Oak Hill Mayor J. Walter Brown, sat on a stage built to look like the bridge. In introductions were followed by a number of speeches, including from representatives of the West Virginia Department of Highways, Michael Baker Corporation, and U.S. Steel. Some speakers affirmed the, bridge immediate, the bridge's immediate engineering significance, while others celebrated the positive impacts the bridge would have on the area. For example, Reverend Billy Reed Wickline called the bridge a rainbow of promised prosperity and progress while Federal Highway's Executive Director Lester Lamb discussed how the bridge's opening closes the gap between Pittsburgh and Miami. Governor Rockefeller held the bridge as a provider of new lifeblood. After four years of construction and an investment of $37 million, the dedication of the New River Bridge had 30,000 people came. Some to be among the first to walk or ride across the world's longest steel arch bridge. Well, you think of it. Well, you think of it. No, it's uh, Along with former governors, Hewlett Smith and Alton Patterson, though you're rich, you to see the bridge open. The opening of this bridge will bring our people of the South and our people of the North closer together than ever before. It will give us not only new transportation, but new life blood. But we must never forget the heritage and the history of which we all are merely trustees. But for the thousands of people who came to Fayette County today, this was the moment. That one and a half hour ceremony ended, ended with a benediction and rendition of country roads. After the river cu ribbon cutting by Governor Rockefeller, that first car drove across the bridge carrying him, his wife Sharon, and the winner of the Daily Mail's essay contest, 16-year-old Thomas Wood. In his essay, which beat out over 1,100 others, Wood told of his ancestor, Abraham Wood, who was the first European explorer of the New River Gorge during the expedition in the 17th century. While this was actually hailed as the first car to drive across the bridge, the bridge was actually open to traffic one week earlier. On Friday, October 14th, Governor Rockefeller ordered the bridge was open to accommodate the expected heavy traffic due to the opening of hunting season. Without fanfare and only a small mention in the local newspaper, the bridge was open at noon that day for 60 hours and closing at, noon, at midnight on Sunday. The day after the dedication and the official opening of the bridge, the editorial and the combined Sunday edition of the Raleigh Register and the Beckley Post-Herald 
described the dedication and likened the opening of the bridge to driving the golden spike that linked the east and the west by railroad in the 1870s. In a full page ad, Beckley newspapers welcomed readers to West Virginia's newest citizen, the Quarter L community that was born yesterday. It's a community bound to grow, bound to flourish, bound to join together the residents of Southern West Virginia. Though the length of quarter L was not even completed at the time, the impacts were almost immediate. For example, by the spring of 78, although there was a coal miner strike, there were impacts. A Summersville car salesman indicated that business picked up nearly 20% after the opening of the bridge, while a truck stop in the same area reported an increase of 30% in overall revenue and 50% in truck business. One trucking company reported an estimate savings in fuel and wages of approximately $3,000 a day by cutting off 500 miles a week. Area hospitals located south of the bridge reported an increase in patients from the north of the gorge, including a 21% increase at Oak Hill Hospital. Prior to the bridge openings, patients north of the gorge found it easier to get to Montgomery or Charleston for their health care needs. The immediate effects of the opening of the bridge and construction of Quarter L were also reflected in the area's population. Between the U.S. Census of 1970 and 1980, the population of Fayetteville actually grew over 38 percent. Comparatively, Charleston actually lost 10 percent in that same time period. While the population increases slowed by the 1990 census, the bridge continued to have an impact. In 1998, the Appalachian Regional Commission funded a study to review the extent at which the completed quarters have helped the ec economy and well-being of Appalachia. The study determined that Quarter L was a good investment of federal tax dollars and that the system has led to increased job opportunity and wages, has made the area more competitive, and, the benef and that it benefits both highway and non-highway users. Over the years, it has continued to draw attention it's been featured in Popular Mechanics after a GMC truck went bungee jumping to prove the strength of its frame, and also has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show in an episode about confronting your fears. And of course, the bridge continues to be a major attraction. Every October, the Bridge Day event welcomes hundreds of base jumpers, repellers, and thrill seekers, in addition to approximately 80,000 spectators. And although the main purpose of the Park Service Canyon Rim Visitor Center is to serve visitors to the park, many of the estimated 300 to 400,000 visitors a year are actually attracted by the bridge. Since opening in September of 2010, Bridge Walk has welcomed 23,000 walkers. These are my feet. Ages 10 to 95, and I fit in there somewhere coming from all 50 states as well as 56 countries to walk on the two-foot wide platform under the roadway 800 feet above the New River. And although I didn't see any that day, since 2011, peregrine falcons, one time nearly extinct, have called it their home and have become a major attraction of their own. And in 2014, they started a family. And there's no shortage, of course, of tchotchkes and other items for sale inspired by the bridge, such as this glass souvenir tray on the top left that I purchased from an antique store years ago when I first moved to West Virginia. And uh, this mini pill box on the bottom left, or the, the uh, model given out at a recent power game, or the snow dome on the bottom right. The continuing positive impacts aside, however, the people of West Virginia are proud of their bridge. During his talk to the Fayette Chamber of Commerce in 1975, American Bridge Division President J.G. Long wrapped up by declaring, I can promise you that you would be proud of your bridge, and in my view, the project will later be honored as one of the great engineering construction feats of the century. His proclamation was exactly right. Not only has the bridge won accolades for its design and construction, but the people of West Virginia are exceptionally proud as well. In two th so much so that in 2005, as you know, it was picked overwhelmingly by the people as a single image to reflect the state on the 2005 state quarter. And it is also commemorated on the 2011 U.S. postage stamp. 
And that is going to wrap up my talk. Before I do so, however, I wanted to point out that Benji Simpson from Bridgewalk is here and has brought a number of materials to share and more facts about the bridge. I've also brought copies of the National Register nomination. I only have about 20 or so um, that I based this lecture off of today. And I also um, have my contact information as well as a list to a few other uh, websites where the uh, videos came from and some additional videos. Are there any questions? Yes, I don't know if it's urban legend or not, but I heard back in the late 70s after it came together that when the two parts of the arch actually came together, they were six inches off or eight inches off. Yes. Is that true? That's, yes, and Benji shaking his head yes, too. Yes, they were actually inches apart, and that was with the, um, with the tieback system. They were able to pull that apart to get the piece in there, the final piece. Am I saying that right, Benji? Yep. True stuff. And let me, let me point out first, I am not an expert. I'm a structural historian, and this is simply my research. So if there's any engineers here and I got it all wrong, I apologize. <laughs> Sir? You said they, they, they finished it by doing what now? The last, um, core, the last piece of the arch, they used a tieback system, which actually worked like the fishing rods and reels and held it just slightly higher than the final design. So when they placed that last piece in, they just had to let the uh, two sides of the arch down in place and bolt it together. I heard that it was laterally apart. Is that correct? Benji, do you know he heard that's... I haven't heard that for no. It doesn't matter. They made it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, a lot of the other bridges on the on the corridors and then on the interstate system as well, in similar scenarios, are not quite the same scale. But you know the the, the structures have um, uh, a road surface that has like a, a, a down uh, or a decline to the center span and then a, an incline uh, back up. And I'm just wondering, um, it seemed like there was a, some sort of insistence on maintaining the, the uh, level road. Uh, Are there any engineers that can speak to that? I am not sure. And I have not come across anything that addresses that in my research, which was pretty extensive. Let me add that when I first, I've only lived here 12 years, but I consider myself a mountaineer now. I think that's long enough, and my son has lived, was born here. But when I first moved here 12 years ago, the first weekend my husband and I spent in Fayette County going to the bridge, and that's when my love for this started. So when I was asked what we could do to contribute, I immediately jumped on this um, and was very excited because most of my job entails actually processing other people's work. So the fact that I actually got to do the writing and the research on this was pretty exciting for me. What's the total way I think that's debatable, the total weight, Benji. I don't think we generally um, have an accurate number. There are num I mean, I can, get, I can check my research. There are numbers that estimate different numbers of the steel, different numbers for the concrete, different numbers for the roadbed. But I don't think there's ever been something established that everyone agrees upon. I'm just curious, the, uh, the roadbed, are there drains? Where does the water go that collects? Yes. There are drains, correct, Benji? There Several are a series of get. drains there on either side, and as you go across, you can watch it. Mm -hmm. And it actually is really neat how they did it. And actually, Jimmy Riskin, who is with Highways, kind of designed the drainage system. They had to change what they had originally planned. Mm -hmm. And so when you're walking a bridge in a rainstorm, then it stops, you just see a little rainbow where it's all coming out very, very pretty. Thank you. You mentioned Jimmy Riston, who works at Highways and who reviewed the National Register nomination for me when it was in draft form. And in reading, when he read about the Core 10 steel saving on paint jobs, he agreed with me on that. But he also added, which I put in a footnote, that it also caused problems in. Um, 
maintaining the bridge because they usually tell by rust if they need to um, address something. And since the entire bridge is rust, they have to um, know what they're doing with special tools um, to see if there's any structural problems on the bridge. So specially trained engineers, I'm told. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, how does this compare with the uh, bridge over Glade Creek on I-64? And secondly, what's the, uh, since the, the bridge is going to rust come totally away after a while, what's the uh, estimated life of the bridge? I'm not sure for either question, unfortunately. I don't know what the lifespan is. I've not come across. The lifespan of the bridge? Today we, we tried to design for 75 years of service. You know, that, that's the present day, 75 years. We can make that time 50 years or so. But it, 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 75 years of service is not where it would be. There's other questions. What's Glade Creek? I think that's a curve bridge. Glade Creek is a deck truss. Okay. A deck truss is Glade right. Creek Bridge. Okay. It is also the 28th highest bridge in the world. So uh, West Virginia has very few bridges. Uh, Glade Creek is the highest bridge on the interstate in the United States. Hmm. <laughs> that's one you can write out to the before you get down. <coughs> Anything else? Well, I thank you all for coming. I want to remind you that I um, have information with my contact information up front here, as well as uh, links to a few other websites where you can see more videos, as well as a link to the nomination. And then I also, um, I wanted to, since there's so many pictures out there of the bridge, I wanted to actually, um, I, I couldn't get all the pictures that I love, the historic construction pictures. So I actually printed them out um, and just brought them along if you wanted to look through. These are some um, uh, inspection pictures in here over the years as well as more construction uh, pictures as well. So I invite you to do that. I invite you to come up and um, see more statistics provided by Bridgewalk and maybe uh, take a walk um, one day yourself and just to prove that I was there. I didn't want to do it, but I did. <laughs> Thank you all for coming again. <laughs>